So um, I appreciate you coming um, to hear about social work as a profession. So I did put my information in the chat box. Of course, I had a typo in the first uh, uh, rendition of my email, but my email is there. Um, should you have any questions um, after this presentation, you can certainly reach out to me at any time. Um, and you know, as um, I am a member of the Adelphi University community, um, I always say that I'm a social worker first, so please feel free to reach out re in regards to any questions that you have about social work in general. So, um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, so as a social worker, obviously, um, this is uh, going to be more interactive than, than lecturing, um, but I'm curious to know um, what your sense is of social work or what you think social work might be or um, if you've had any experience um, or know any social workers in your life, um, it's usually um, a place to, to start when having these discussions. So you could feel free to unmute yourself. I think we have three folks here if you're comfortable you know, sharing. Okay, so maybe we'll warm everybody up first. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so I went to school to be a math teacher. And very quickly into my education, I realized that um, I very much so wanted to work with children, but that I didn't want to teach them math. Um, and so a good friend of mine said, you know, hey, Cheryl, you, you really like to help people. Um, you know, I, I used to find myself um, being that person that people would come to and talk to and confide in and not necessarily give advice, but listen. Um, and she said to me, I think you should try social work. That was my first um, uh, uh, introduction to social work. Um, and so I did, and as it turns out, I loved it. Um, and so what I say about social work, the first thing that you need to know is, do you wanna help people? Um, and do you like to help people? And do you like to work with people? Um, so it's even in the title, it's social. So it is important to be able to, um, you know, have a desire to want to communicate and be around others. Um, so very quickly um, in my education, I realized not only did I have interest in working with children, I had interest in working with victims. Um, I had interest in learning about other populations such as substance abuse, child abuse, um, and what I found out was that it, with a degree in social work, the opportunities are endless. Um, and so I went on to finish my undergraduate degree um, in social work, and then I completed my master's also in social work. Um, once you have your degree in social work, the career opportunities are so wide um, that it's, it's really impossible to not be able to get a job. And so oftentimes I ask students when they come into you know, my office at Adelphi and I ask them, what, can, what do you see yourself doing you know, after college? Um, you know, some students pick classes based on, uh, pick a major based on the classes that are interesting to them. But it, you really have to think long-term, you know, after college, what am I gonna do um, in my career? And um, so what I have them do is I have them go online and search for jobs as if they were graduating that day. So that's something I encourage you all to do as you're thinking about a major. So if you're thinking about social work as a major, you know, hop on Google and just search social work jobs in your area. And if you go through that list and you're like, oh yes, I, oh, that sounds so interesting or I can see myself doing that or this is really you know, something that I could consider, you know, then you know that you're on the right track. If you go down the list and you're like, oh gosh, no way, no, 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 definitely not. You know, then even though the coursework might sound interesting, the overall profession may not be um, for you. So if I had to say anything, and, and that's for any major, I really do encourage students to do that. Um, I'm going to give you a, a tidbit into um, my career path, um, because I think it explains, again, the breadth of social work as a, um, as a career. So um, again, I went to school, um, and in, in my heart of hearts, I really wanted to work with children. 
Um, and so when I graduated, I was working um, in a domestic violence safe home as a child's uh, advocate. And really what I did there was to provide support for the children as many of these children, you know, fled um, some, you know, serious situations with their mothers. Um, and so acclimating them to school, getting them into therapeutic services, sometimes just playing and hanging out with them, you know, getting them comfortable in the house um, and, and being a, a primary support focused on the children. Um, from that, and this is the great thing about social work, from that I realized I really wanted to work with victims. So I, I started um, working for the New York State Police as a crime victims advocate. And then with that job, I got to work with all different, you know, types of victims, um, families of victims, um, and, and, and essentially a lot of the work was focused around domestic violence, um, homicide, suicide, things like that. So a lot of violence. Um, and then from there, I learned so much about the victim side that I was like, I wanna learn about the other side. And so this is more what we call forensic social work. So then I worked in a maximum facility prison. And most people are like, why would you ever wanna do something like that? Um, but for me, I was so curious about, you know, I had worked with the victims and now I wanted to learn about the perpetrator side of things. Um, and so for many of them, I worked very much with the uh, inmates and then as well as um, their families really processing with them, um, you know, the situation that their family member was in and many of them were serving life sentences and what that might be like. Many of them had children, what that was like and going through that um, experience with them as a support. Um, and then I did go back to working with children in child welfare, and I actually stayed there for quite some time. Um, and I worked in a residential treatment center, which is where children reside and live, attend school, get all their um, therapy services, um, occupational services. Uh, we call it independent living, where we teach, you know, folks um, how to food shop, how to have a bank account, you know, all all different things like that. Um, but I'm gonna fast forward real quick. Um, and prior to working at Adelphi University, um, I was trained across the country and my clinical expertise is in zero to five-year-olds. So I share this with you because I feel like it's a, a pretty good example. At, and I, trust me, I had many different jobs in between, but it's a really good example of how you start in one place and can just grow and move and switch and change and decide as your interests unfold in your current, um, you know, employments without going back to school. So once I had my master's, again, you know, these job opportunities were all really at my fingertips. Um, so in social work school, any questions on that or comments or thoughts or I don't know if folks realize how um, the wide range of social work. I did have one question. Um, I know you were saying, so I, I've always heard of social workers working on the victim side of things. And I know you had said um, working on the perpetrator side of things, like with working with inmates. I'm just curious, like what is the social worker's role kind of in that aspect? Cause I've never really heard of that before. So I find that interesting. Yeah, so it's it's very different. Um, and I think, well, for me, it was not something I could do for very long because you are really dealing with some folks who have committed some really serious crimes, especially um, at a maximum facility, right? Again, this is where folks are generally for life, uh, no opportunity for probation or parole. So with that being said, they, there's not much motivation to do therapeutic work on yourself, right? If you know you're gonna be in prison for the rest of your life, it's like, well, why, you know? Um, however, once you can get people in the room um, and really engaged in conversation and asking them to just share about themselves, uh, learning and understanding who they are, um, most folks have their own trauma histories. Um, most folks have been victims themselves before they are perpetrators. And so it's very interesting to hear their story of how they've become them and who they are, you know, today and, you know, where their mindset 
kind of shifted. And for many of them, they do have remorse, um, you know, so they say and share, um, at, we can only know as genuine as it is, uh, you know, sitting with them, but also you're doing a lot of work with the family members. And once, you know, uh, an inmate connects you as the connection to their family, that's like the buy-in. Um, and so now I'm the person, if you come see me regularly and we have solid good sessions and you're reflective and you're engaging in conversation, and that means that you can get an hour visitation once a month, they'll do that. That's huge. Um, so you always have to find, and this is with any client, you have to, and if you think about kids, right, you have to find something for them to work for, right? What is the end goal? What is, what is something that they really want and desire and, and use that as the engagement? But yes, it's, it's a very different side. And um, you know, you can work in the police districts, you can work in, you know, local prisons. Um, it's not only, you don't have to, you know, be in a maximum facility uh, uh, institution to work with perpetrators. Um, currently on Long Island, we have the Safe Center, which is the um, merge of the Coalition Against uh, child abuse and neglect and the coalition against domestic violence. Um, and since they merged together, they work with domestic violence perpetrators. So they don't only work with the victim. So if you're interested in that side of things as well, but it is a more uncommon route. Um, and I, and I say, you know, I learned so much about the victims that I wanted to learn so much about the other side as well. And then one other question that I had too, um, as you were talking, I know you were saying with social work, one of the great things is that you can move around, like you were saying, to different jobs and things. Are the certifications different for that? Or is it just once you have your master's degree, then that's, you're pretty much open then? Yes. So your bachelor's degree is what we call um, your generalist practice degree. Um, and so that's your undergraduate four-year bachelor's degree where you're trained to work in a general, um, you know, practice. So we cover all areas in your education. I mean, I, I, of course, it's not every single area, but we do cover working, you know, uh, in hospitals. Um, so medical social work, forensic social work, child welfare, addictions, um, you know, and, and the, really the opportunities are endless. Um, when you're in your undergraduate, particularly at Adelphi, um, you have two years of internships. So you get to have those experiences, but we call the master's the terminal degree. So you do want to get your master's in social work. Um, another great thing about getting your bachelor's in social work is that if you get your BSW, your bachelor's in social work specifically, um, your master's is only one year. So after you get your master's, you get licensed. And so to answer your question, once you have that license, you know, that's it, you're ready to go. Um, and so you can really jump around. And the master's degree, we call your degree in advanced clinical practice. So rather than generalist practice, this is your advanced clinical practice. Um, and so it affords you that opportunity to to bump around because the skills that you're learning are applicable to all different populations in all different types of settings. Um, you may have in-service trainings at your employers, you know, so um, when I started working with zero to five-year-olds, um, I had, you know, within my employment, they gave me clinical training, but it, like I didn't pay for it. It's not like I had to go back to school for it. Um, and so, you know, that's, I, um, I guess you could say would be like a certification, but there's nothing else you need to go for once you get that master's degree. And that, that's, I think, you know, I, I say it all the time, but that's the beauty of the degree, right? You could do your four years, fifth year for your master's, get your license, and then, you know, wherever the world takes you. And also, if you get licensed in New York, your license is transferable pretty much across the U.S. Um, Texas and California have some, you know, um, additional requirements when you transfer your license, but, you know, you can move anywhere. And I also want to say, too, um, you know, when you're in school, um, 
Well, I don't know what year you're all in and how far into thinking about colleges you are. Um, but one other general suggestion that I would make for you uh, is if you have an idea of what you want to major in, go in as that major. Um, and many students come in undecided because they're just not exactly sure. Um, and the challenge with that is that then you're placed in a whole bunch of different classes. You meet with advisor that knows a little bit about everything, but not much about one. And you don't really get an in-depth uh, awareness of what, what that major is. And so I encourage you when that time comes for you, um, that whether it be social work or psychology or education or history, whatever it is, um, declare that major. It's very easy to change your major. So if you're in the major and you're deciding, you know what, this is not for me, uh, it's very easy at all colleges and institutions to change your major. Um, but when you go in declaring the major, you meet with somebody from that department, they'll share information with you about the major, you'll get a little bit more um, of a heartier experience in, in knowing what that major is versus going in undeclared, if that makes sense. Any other questions? So, um, some students uh, ask me about different, you know, like actual careers in social work. So where might I work as a social worker? Um, so we just um, developed this brochure. I can kind of show you the front of it. Um, and uh, this is one of our recent graduates. And what we know um, from Adelphi actually, and um, this has been for the last five years, is that our school our students that graduate with their bachelor's in social work, 100% of them report either continuing their education, going on for that MSW right away, or um, finding employment within six months of their graduation. So when I say it's really impossible to not find a job, there's always jobs in social work. Um, so what is the main difference between psychology and social work? So that's a very, very, very common question. Um, the main theoretical difference is the viewpoints that we provide treatment from. So um, psychology is more cognitively focused um, and working um, more around like brain development and neuroscience and, and understanding the psyche. Um, it's a little bit more narrow focused um, in their treatment perspective where social work wants to know everything about everything about everything. And so the way I explain social work is um, when you think about when you throw a pebble in a pond and there's you know one ripple after the next, after the next, well, we wanna know every ripple, every layer of our clients. So we wanna know who you are at home. We wanna know who you are in your community. We wanna know who you are at work. We wanna know who you are as a parent, as a brother, as a sister. Um, we want to know you in every possible facet of your life um, to understand every part of you in order to provide um, treatment. So we, we have a more wide um, frame in terms of our treatment base. Um, that would be like our theoretical um, difference. Um, educationally speaking, it, there is a very big difference. So in psychology, you have to continue on for a um, doctorate in psychology or a PhD in psychology in order to practice. It's after you get that is when you can get your license um, and practice. And so with social work, it's a master's. You don't have to go on for that PhD. So that's, you know, a four or five year, you know, difference in terms of education. Um, the other piece is, is that psychology is also around clinical focus, um, whereas social work, we always talk about the direct service work, um, but we also have other pieces of social work that sometimes tend to get, you know, um, left out, um, and we call that our macro level of social work. And so there are folks that come into social work, but don't want to work with people individually and or in groups or you know providing a direct service 
Um, and many of these folks go into macro practice and they work um, in community organizing. They do um, policy advocacy. Um, you know, they're the ones that are writing grants, um, writing proposals for different changes in policies that impact, you know, what the direct service uh, providers are able to do. So for example, in substance abuse, we're, are, we're always having folks um, lobbying for more eligibility for folks in need of um, substance abuse counseling. So insurances, it's very limited services that you can get. So while I might not be the one providing the service, I'm writing the one lobbying I'm, I'm the one writing and lobbying for, you know, extending the length of treatment for those who are um, in need of substance abuse treatment. Um, and then we, you know, have our social justice uh, mission as well. And so, you know, really social work is around um, equity for all, um, treating all individuals with respect and dignity. Um, one of the things that I tell my class all the time is your client they're the professional of themselves. Nobody knows them best but them, right? And so you can come into the room with all this knowledge, but they know themselves best. Um, and it's really important to um, recognize that when we're working um, with individuals. And so that's, you know, so we have all these different lenses and frameworks and, um, and different ways of viewing, um, I don't wanna say problems, situations, challenges, um, versus where psychology is really more focused on the clinical uh, intervention. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, so yeah, so when we were developing this flyer, we surveyed our recent um, graduates to see where they're working. So just to give you an idea, um, we have folks working at the Long Island um, Coalition for the Homeless. Um, we have uh, folks working with Alzheimer's and Dementia Center um, in schools such as Nassau Boses. Um, of course, um, we have New York State uh, Department of Probation, Department of Corrections. Um, the VA uh, veterans work is ever growing. Um, and so there, that's an endless, again, opportunity. Um, North Shore Child and Family Guidance Center, which provides mental health services for children and adults and families. Um, youth and community centers, um, psychiatric centers, hospitals. Again, the safe center, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and then we have, uh, again, folks in the Department of Health and Human Services, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And some of these folks, again, like I said, uh, may not be providing the direct service work, but are working more, you know, on the top level. Um, for folks working with individuals with disabilities, um, advocacy groups, um, LGBTQ plus community. So, and that was just like, a couple that we could fit on our flyer. <laughs> um, and so just, you know, to give you a general idea of different careers. The other thing that I think is worth noting for you all too, is that um, when you go to school to be a social worker, we really do prepare you to go out in the world and do the work. Um, I will never forget <laughs> on my first day as an MSW intern, I was working in an outpatient mental health clinic um, that was also um, connected to a methadone clinic, which is a drug used um, for heroin addicts to um, help um, uh, titrate off of, uh, of heroin. Um, and I remember sitting there and I remember my first client coming in and I remember looking at my supervisor and being like, are you going to come in with me? And she was like, no, you're ready. And in my mind, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm ready. And when I got in that room, I really realized that I was ready. And I really do that, owe that to my education. And I did my master's um, at Adelphi. So I could speak, you know, specifically to that program there. Um, and so 
in the classes that you're taking, you're taking practice classes, right? So you're learning tangible skills to go out in the world and do this work, how to engage with clients, how to assess clients, how to understand, how to ask the right questions, um, how to read body language, um, you know, and then also we, you take classes in human behavior. So it's like, why do we do what we do? Right. So we think about how our, you know, thoughts drive our reactions, which drive our behaviors, but why, you know, why is that? And so in that class, you learn about that. You learn about how one person may look and present so differently in their home versus at their work. And I say to students all the time in my class, right? They present one way in class that probably looks very different on a Friday night, right? So that's okay. That's normal human behavior. But why is that, right? So you're learning all about that. You're learning about social welfare policy, understanding the rules of the road, basically, and why things have developed this way, understanding what we need to do better. Um, you take a class in um, oppression and diversity. So getting a real good handle on racism, classism, ableism, um, you know, and, and all the isms and, you know, learning how to work with different populations, understanding different populations. So in, and th that's not all the classes, you take a lot more classes, but um, you're learning the skills to go out and be a social worker. So different from some other majors, um, and other disciplines, we call it, it's a professional degree. We're training you in your education to be a professional. I'll ask, um, I did have one question. I know um, there's a lot of um, uh, clinical work that you guys do and like actual internships and things like that. I know the world is a little different now because of uh, the COVID-19 and things like that. So I was just wondering um, how that has affected Adelphi and specifically like classes. Are you guys all remote? Are you remote in person? Things like that. Sure. That's a great question. And, you know, last year I had a parent ask me, I don't want to know what the university is doing. I want to know specifically about the School of Social Work. And I really appreciated her question because the truth is we're the social workers we run towards the crisis and not away. So if any school in the university should be handling it well, it's us, right? Um, and so I, so for that reason is, is, you know, I really, I welcome the question. So Adelphi as a university um, this year, I would say is a very mixed modality. Um, there are um, some in-person classes um, and there are also remote classes. Every in-person class has the opportunity to attend remote. So for example, I teach the Intro to Social Work course. Um, and so in my class, I had last semester, I had about um, 15 students in the classroom. And then I had about 10 students live streaming, you know, during the time that I was teaching. Um, and so most of our classes are synchronous online, meaning that you still meet for that hour and a half, you know, twice a week via Zoom um, with your professor. And then we do have courses where um, we call that asynchronous online, meaning that each week you're assigned work and it's more self-directed learning. Um, in terms of internships, so in March when COVID hit, that was a real struggle. Obviously nobody was prepared for something like that. Um, and many um, agencies and organizations had to shut down. Um, and so we responded to that with providing our students uh, different opportunities within the school, within assignments. Um, we called it alternative learning assignments so that they could still obtain their internship hours and the competencies that they need to learn to finish their degree because we didn't want anybody to get stuck because of the pandemic, right? Uh, those folks who were supposed to graduate last May all were able to graduate last May. Having the whole summer then to prepare for the fall, um, we had a lot of students that did um, remote internships. Um, and then we also had quite a bit of students that were in person in their internships. And then we did have uh, some students who preferred to do alternative assignments. 
Um, and we did give students that option. You know, again, um, we're not forcing anybody to be in an atmosphere in which they might feel uncomfortable. Um, while many of our students were interested in engaging in in-person activities, they may live with somebody who, you know, they were afraid of, you know, contracting and spreading. And so um, we really let the students drive um, the decision around where they might want to be. Um, and then I will tell you, it's been, you know, a moving target since the fall. Um, as the numbers rose, our students that were in hospitals were asked to leave. They no longer want to host interns. And so then we've been managing and figuring out where to replace these students or giving them alternative assignments. Um, but our mission is not to let anybody fall behind. And so with that, you have to gain your hours. But as I said before, you still have to learn the skills because when you graduate, you're going to be expected to know those skills. Um, so we've been working with uh, different simulation projects um, and doing, you know, providing services through, you know, simulation uh, techniques. Um, and that's been really interesting. Um, we also have a social action day where our students uh, pick an, a social problem and you know, we do a whole day about it. There's a lecturer, we do breakout groups, um, we do resources. And so we have students working on that as a project. Um, and so we've been really creative. And thankfully the Council of Social Work Education, which is the national organization that accredits our schools um, has been very flexible with us um, in terms of what we can uh, approve for internship hours. And, and I suspect that it is going to continue to be a moving target, um, but I do feel that we've matched it well. I feel prepared for it. Um, I feel like we have, we have a whole um, team of folks that are designated to work within your, we call it field placement, which is your internship. Um, and so those for, folks are working very hard, um, but you know, I, I feel comfortable in it and our students feel comfortable in it. Um, and I think that's what's most important. So I hope that answers your question. And I'm hoping that by fall, we'll resume a little bit more normalcy in terms of the way we typically direct our education, which has been you know, in person. Um, so my hope is that by the fall, we're resuming more in-person classes. I think for some time, we will always have the option for live stream, again, for folks who have um, concerns. And, and I think that's an appropriate way for the university, you know, to conduct themselves. Other questions? I don't know if you can hear my kids running around upstairs. Yes, you can. <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> they were quiet. That was more concerning. <laughs> um, I guess one other question that I would have too is, do you have any advice for um, someone who is still in high school, if this is something that they are interested in, anything that they could be doing now, either to prepare to skills or, you know, or anything for that? <laughs> yes, thank you. That's exactly where I was going next. Um, so we often talk to folks again, you know, what do I do? How do I prepare myself? Um, so I really suggest if you're interested in doing direct service work, work with people as much as you can. And so, you know, I know that there have been, you know, camps that were summer camps that were open last year. If you're interested in working with children, you know, work in a summer camp, um, volunteer at a nursing home if it's possible. And again, they are allowing folks to do this remotely, you know, as well. Um, I have a student who volunteers and he does bingo every Friday night, you know, at a nursing home over Zoom. Um, and, you know, he's in social work school. It's just really a for fun thing that he does. So um, these are opportunities that you can, you know, still get involved with um, during COVID. So any way that you can connect with people, um, if you, you know, are looking to work a part-time job, um, you know, sales, got to manage people, working in a restaurant, you have to manage people, you know, anything that involves working and being connected and talking to and involved with people. So again, there's a lot of opportunities for that as well. 
Um, but I always say my, my retail experience, I think definitely laid the road to social work. That's one of the hardest jobs I've ever had, um, working in retail during the holidays, um, and, and dealing and managing with people who are stressed and frustrated and anxious and worried and trying to just get their stuff done and don't want to wait online. And, you know, again, you know, just being with people, um, and confronting that. If your school, you know, has a volunteer group, um, you know, like um, what well, we used to do a lot of talks with, um, you know, high school groups. Um, so some that would do, you know, community, you know, volunteer work, um, you know, that would be another great way to get involved. Um, food pantries, soup kitchens. Um, again, um, the VA um, has been a little bit not so much allowing uh, volunteers coming in, but as things get better, they might. Um, so thinking about what population you might want to work with and, and trying to go towards that. Um, but really, any experience with people is experience um, because that's, real, that's, that's the whole degree. It's a people degree. I also had a question uh, in the chat too. What is the difference between a certified social worker and a licensed social worker? Yes. Okay. So we no longer have um, certified social workers. Um, when, so, but you, I don't know if the person is referring to an LCSW. So there's two layers of licensure for social work. Um, the first is your LMSW. So after you graduate with your master's, we encourage students to sit right away for the exam. That makes you a licensed master's in social work. That's what, what my licensure is in. If you choose to go on and pursue a, a more clinical career, um, after you get your LMSW, you can work and provide clinical work with the supervision of somebody with an LCSW or a PhD. And then three years of doing that, you can sit for the next level of exam, which is an LCSW. And that makes you a licensed clinical social worker. So if you're interested in going into private practice, whether it's your own or working for somebody else, um, or you know, climbing the ladder to be like a clinical director somewhere, that would be, you know, where you would want to, to go um, with your licensure. And then once you're an LCSW, that all is also what gives you the allowance to get on insurance panels for billing, um, you know, to be able to accept insurance for billing and moving forward um, in that way. Um, just for clarification purposes, the PhD in social work is really only if you're interested in higher education. Um, so that's, you know, how I ended up going for my PhD is because I realized that, you know, I was, I was an adjunct professor and I was really interested in working in a university more full time. And so that's why I went back and then got my PhD. But had I not wanted to do that, I would have just continued on to my LCSW. So I hope that clarifies. So again, you know, you get your master's and then you sit for the licensing. And then if you choose to, you can sit for the second uh, licensing exam, which would be the LC. And so if, if um, somebody has seen a certified social worker, there probably have been a social worker for many, 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 many years. <laughs> um, or they have a licensure from another state and that's how it transferred in. Great. Uh, there was another one too. Uh, what types of specialization does the social work program offer at Adelphi? So that's a very good question. Um, so we have, it, so in your undergraduate, there is no specializing because your degree is grounded in liberal arts. So you're going to take all your general education requirements, your maths, your sciences, your histories, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you're going to take your generalist practice courses with some elective courses that you can then choose what areas. So if you wanna take a class in aging, if you wanna take a class in working with immigrants, um, if you wanna take a class in working with children, you have those options. Um, in the master's program, 
we have four different specializations. Um, however, I will say is that contrary to the belief, most students do not specialize. And the reason for that is because they prefer to take electives in multiple areas. So if you specialize in children and families, then you're not taking any electives in substance abuse. And the challenge with that is that if you're working with children and families, you're probably going to be working with substance abuse also. And so therefore, it's so, and I say it's a, it's a good question because Adelphi went back and forth for many, many years about having specializations. And a few years ago, we finally declared specializations and it has not stuck. <laughs> you know, the interest is more around, you know what, um, I want to take a class in community leadership, you know, understanding how to run an organization. But I also want to take a class in adolescent, um, you know, mental health. And I also want to take a class in addictions and substance abuse. So, um, yeah, so toward that end, um, we do have different, uh, four different specializations. Specialization. So one is in uh, leadership and management. Um, and you'll have to forgive me because I'm in the BSW. I don't know them like the full titles. Um, but one is in leadership and management. Um, one is in health, mental health, uh, and aging. One is in child and family, uh, you know, services. And the other is in substance abuse um, area. So I apologize, I don't know the technical titles, but that's what they are. And again, you know, if you think about it, as you're going through your career, you you might want to have dappled in a, um, you know, elective on different things. So we don't require that you specialize, but it is an option. You all uh, graduate with the same degree. I think, I mean, I, I will put in a plug for Delphi <laughs> um, in, in one fashion, because I do think it's important, especially um, in uh, a social work education. Um, and so whether it be Adelphi or another school that you're looking into, um, but I would really look into your class sizes. Um, so one of the, again, benefits at Adelphi is um, we have very small class sizes. And so the max amount of students, and this is mostly in master's courses, would be 35 students in a class. That's a lot for us. Um, most have between 20 and 25. And the reason why I think that's important, particularly in a social work education, is because it really needs to be not a lecture-based, you know, type of experience, but a more communal type of classroom where, you know, students feel comfortable engaging in conversation and having dialogue with the instructor. Um, and so, you know, in practice classes where you're learning those tangible skills, um, we only have 20 students in each of those classes and they're even smaller so that students can say, you know, oh, I was in my internship and I tried this and it was fantastic. Or I was in my internship and I tried this and it really didn't work so well, right? Because what you tried that might not have worked with your client might actually be successful for another classmate with their clients. So we're always sharing those types of experiences. Um, but really, um, being that it is, a, um, you know, I don't know if we're considered small or mid-sized program technically, but I, I refer to it as like cheers. You know, everybody knows your name. So when you come into the School of Social Work, you know, you, you get to know me, you get to know your other advisors, you get to know your faculty members, um, you get to know people that are working currently in the social work community. Um, so we have full-time professors and we have adjunct professors. Our adjuncts are working full time as you know social work practitioners and then teaching for us part time. So right again from the very beginning, you're building your professional network um, and being able to uh, build and maintain and connect and have those relationships. I think is really important for your education and then also your ongoing you know future career. Um, we have a lot of students who get employment via their internships. Or we even have students that, you know, finish their bachelor's degree, do their master's, and then that get called back to an internship that they had to say, hey, now that you're done with your master's, why don't you come work for us? Um, 
And so, you know, we do have a solid, you know, reputation for social work um, education. We're at the top in the top five of the country. Um, and so we've, and we've also been around, I think it's over 70 years now. Um, so I think we, we have a well-oiled uh, machine here um, that we manage well and keep up to date and, you know, keep abreast of, of the newest, um, you know, ways of conducting social work and different practice models and such. Um, but I do think um, that having those small classes and being able to be with and in, you know, the classroom community is really important in your education. It's really the start of learning how to be a social worker. Okay, well, I will say um, we're getting towards the end of our time. So I'm gonna do kind of a last minute call for questions. If anybody has any last minute thoughts or questions or anything you wanna throw in the chat, um, please do. Or if you wanna unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to. I love to hear other people. <laughs> um, so you're more than welcome to do that as well. Um, and just while I have everybody for just a moment, um, just something to bring to everybody's attention, we are going to be having um, more of these programs. Um, and we also have a new series, uh, Meet the Professional programs as well, where we have people who are also in the field talking about um, their different careers and things like that. So we do have our Meet the Professionals with a lawyer uh, coming up on the 26th, and then a special education teacher coming up on uh, February 9th. And then we'll have a representative from uh, Malloy College who will be talking about their nursing program on the 23rd of February. So please check our calendar. We're constantly adding new programs. Um, we're also having a program on uh, February 3rd, which we'll be discussing uh, community service and admissions and how COVID has changed those things. Um, so different opportunities you know, for, for you to look into that as well. Um, but please check our website. We are here to help. And if you have any things that you want us to be looking into, different programs that you, um, different uh, colleges or um, college majors or different professions that you are interested in, you can always email us at teens at levittownpl.org. And we will try to get um, some connections with some professionals in that way as well. So uh, if anybody has any last minute questions before we wrap everything up, um, please feel free. <laughs> I'll put my email one more time appropriately spelled in the chat um, because you you know, I feel like there's always that moment where you hang up and you're like, oh gosh, I wish I would have asked. Um, and so you're, please feel free to email me at any time. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions and thank you, you know, uh, Levittown Library for hosting these events. I think they're really phenomenal and I hope that you know, um, folks that are on today continue to experience more um, of them because it's a really great way to learn different careers and also about the college uh, application. And as you were saying, you know, that whole process. So thank you. <laughs> it's wonderful. All right, well, if we have no last minute questions, um, I just wanna say thank you again uh, to Cheryl uh, for joining us today and telling us all about social work. I didn't even realize how expansive and how many opportunities there are. Um, so thank you so much for letting us know all about those things. And um, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Again, please do not hesitate. If anybody has any questions, you can always reach out to us um, and I hope everyone has a great night. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you for having me. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. All right. Have a great night, guys. Thank you.